On behalf of New York Encounter, I'd like to welcome John Waters, whose full bio can be found in the Encounter program. Here's the short version. Having started his career in 1981 with the Irish music journal Hot Press, John Waters later wrote in the Irish Times from 1990 to 2014. His first book, Jiving at the Crossroads, 1991, about the cultural underbelly of Irish politics, became a massive bestseller. He went on to write and publish nine other books. He currently writes for First Things, and he is a permanent research fellow at the Center for Ethics and Culture, University of Notre Dame, Indiana. His latest book, Give Us Back the Bad Roads, was published in October 2018. Kind of formula, and, and I, this is kind of part of what I want to say about this 
in this uh, talk, which is based on an exhibition I did two years ago in Remedy. That, and some of it may be obvious to everybody. Maybe all of it will be obvious to everybody. But I think it's not obvious to the culture, and that's kind of why I wanted to do it. That there's something more in all of this than we allow ourselves to talk about, than we allow ourselves to see. And that video, that particular song, <coughs> that version, to me it's, a, it's really extraordinary because it's Elvis at his finest, at his most doing what Elvis is, doing what Elvis was. And there are certain moments when you can see, you can see it in the faces of those two women who are watching it. And it's not lust, it's something bigger than lust. It's something beyond that. It's, it's an attraction to something extraordinary. And Elvis knows this and he is, you know, privileged and knows he is because he was a real gentleman in his sensibility. He knows the gift he has. And he sings the song. But more than that, the song sings him. And this is a particular thing, I think, that is in rock and roll that, that we don't see so much or know about. The idea of a song in rock and roll is something much more than a song in any other context. Because so much depends not just on the construction of the song, the words, the melodies, but on the personality of the sounds, the personality of the singer. And there's a word, an Irish word called Yara, Y-A-R-R-A-G-E-H, which comes from a great uh, Irish tenor called John Con McCormack. And he invented this word as a description of this moment <coughs> when he said the singer ceases to sing the song and the song starts to sing the singer. And I think this is what we see in that video more than anything else. That Elvis is being sung by the song. He's not really a singer at all. He's something more than a singer. He's Elvis. And this is really what was his tragedy because he's in a place that nobody can reach him and he can't reach anybody else because he has this extraordinary gift and what it is I want to try and get at not just about Elvis but about lots of other artists like him um, so that, that phrase actually I, I, in my introduction in the program there's a phrase about the hotness of the song um, what was of the song emerging from the vestments of appearance? I have to admit, I think Rear Old Man Scalpo thought I made that up and he started calling me a poet, but actually it's about James Joyce. So, in case we're here, I have to all know uh, that it's not me really. But there's another thing about that video where you can actually see already the, the tragedy. Because that, that moment where he impishly picks up the curtain, Elvis picks up the curtain and peeps out. It's almost like he's, he's a prisoner and knows it. And he's looking out at these people that he can't really be part of anymore. And then you go back, so you, you see from behind that he comes and he's led away by all these minders. And it is again like he's a prisoner. And that's, that is the tragedy of Elvis, that he, he achieved everything that you could want, or you might think you want, with a great gift. And yet he was a prisoner and died a prisoner just a few years later. And that's kind of what I wanted to get out of it. More complicated than that, but... But that song, when I was writing about hot press, writing hot press about music, I didn't know what to do, I didn't know what it was about until I read this extract from a book called Mystery Train. You know, Flannery Connor said that the novel was essentially about two things, mystery and manners. And I, I wrote a book about you two years ago, and I, and I, call it, I said that rock and roll is really about two things as well, mystery and mischief. And again, you can see that in, in that video by Elvis. But I read, I used to write about stuff, and so there was a formula we'd write for them, review a concert, and a little bit about the crowd, a little bit about the, the band, who played well, who, who played what, maybe an incident, the songs they sang. And that was the way everybody wrote about music, pretty much. All pretty formulaic stuff. Until one day I read, I was reading this book by, by Graham Marcus called Mystery Train, about Elvis. He's a great American writer. And I, went, and I came across this passage in the book. 
There are those moments when Elvis Presley, he's talking about being in Vegas and watching Elvis, it's for the first time he's seen him live, he's looking up at him. There are those moments when Elvis Presley breaks through the public world he has made for himself, and only a fool or a liar would deny their power. Something entirely his, driven by two decades of history and met, met all live in, live in person, is transformed into an energy that ecsta is ecstatic. It is, to use the word in its old sense, illuminating. The overstated grandeur is suddenly authentic and Elvis brings a thrill different from and far beyond anything else in our culture. Like an old Phil Spector record, he matches for an instant the bigness, the intensity and the unpredictability of America itself. It might be that time when he sings How Great Thou Art with all the faith of a backwoods Jonathan Edwards. It might be the very end of the night when he closes his show with Can't Help Falling In Love and his song takes on a glow that might make you feel his capacity for affection is all superhuman. Whatever it is, it will be music that excludes no one and still passes on something valuable to everyone who is there. It is as if the America that Elvis throws away for most of his performance can be given life again at will. And that was the phrase that I think changed my whole attitude to what writing was, what music was. He said, the song takes on the glow that might make you feel his capacity for affection is all but superhuman. I thought, that's it. That's the bar. That's what Elvis is, that's what his, but that's also the bar if you want to write about Elvis, if you want to write about this stuff. That's the way you have to think about it. It's not about describing a performance. It's not about describing entertainment. It's not even about describing musicians and songs. There's something else happening. Capacity for affection is all but superhuman. Brian Eno, the, a lot of what I'm doing is just putting together quotes from people, and a few of them are from myself, because as a great Patrick, uh, great Irish poet, Patrick Kavanagh said, you know, um, you should always tell the truth, and uh, sometimes, sometimes there aren't better quotes than the ones I made. So he, he says, you should always tell the truth, even when it's in favour of yourself. So I, I try to stick with that too. So, Brian Eno said this, I think the echo on Elvis's Heartbreak Hotel is better than the song itself, by far. This is what I'm getting at. The song is there, but the echo is better than the song itself. Nobody could tell me what that was in my family. They didn't know what to make of that sound. It turns the studio into a cave. When I was young, the most overpowering sense of wonder was inspired by, in me by music. One of the things that, you know, when we were growing up and we loved this music was that um, people would say, you can't make out the words. I don't know what the words are about, you know. And that's true, but it actually doesn't matter. I, I, the first song I uh, uh, we adored was an English band called T-Rex. Mark Bowen called, uh, who had also came to a terrible end a very short time after Elvis. And it was called Ride a White Swan. And I, to this day, I still haven't a clue what the words are about. But it changed my life. Because I, when I heard this song, I thought, this is a different place. This is a different way of seeing the world. It's a different uh, view onto the world. And it's mine, I share it. This guy knows something about me that I didn't even know about myself, even though we've never met. Um, so what I'm kind of thinking of saying is, and it's, a, you know, that we have to be very careful not to overload, because the very nature of this music is that it's, modest about itself, it's, it's evasive about itself, it's, it's, uh, it, it allows the music to be without talking about itself too much and you can over talk it, but sometimes once in a while you have to just say it, because in the modern world so many people are in, isolated in themselves and they have intuitions about things which they don't think anybody shares, and more and more the pressure down upon us to stay silent about lots of stuff means that we feel that we alone have this sense of the world. And as a kid I didn't, you know, it was only when I heard songs that I could relate to 
that I thought, ah, I'm not actually on my own. I'm not the only crazy person who thinks like this. So it is, I don't necessarily say that when I use the word transcendence in this context, that it's necessarily, you can decide, religious transcendence, or what we think of as religious. But I think it is nevertheless transcendent in two ways. One is backwards transcendence, which is nostalgia, and the other transcendence, which is into the, into the infinite future, infinity. And I think this is what the music aims for. This is why we loved it. We didn't know. We thought it was just because it was hip and cool and all that. But the reason it was hip and cool and all that was because it was doing this stuff. And that connected with us. But nobody told us because when we read about it in the papers, it was done in these cliches. Or it was done in the tabloids. It was like, you know, people were called rockers. Rocker Elvis. Um, completely reductive. And we kind of felt a bit embarrassed about that that we like this music in spite of the fact that it could be given this kind of description. So there was like something there and we, did, we never articulated what it was. Um, so the song, the, the words of uh, Ride Wild Swan or something like that, but this ride, ride it on, ride it out like a bird in the skyways. Write it on out like you were a bird. Fly it all out like an eagle in a sunbeam. Write it on out like you were a bird. And then the, the guitar solo. The amazing thing about that song is actually, yeah, maybe you don't know it, but it, it, it happens in a lot of songs. This, that even at my age, I can hear that song and I'm transported, I'm teleported. Not to a place, but to a certain place in myself. And the only thing about that song that destroys that for its guitar solo. And that's very interesting because it's, to, it's that the guitar solo uniquely, you, alone in that song, has been rendered cliched in the intro because people have imitated it so much. And it's very it's now become like a meme of, of uh, uh, rock and roll. Uh, Brian Eno used to warn about this, the producer who produced Talking Heads and U2 and lots of different bands, Coldplay. He called himself a non-musician, even though he did play with Ross Roxy Music, he played keyboards. And, and he always warned about the danger of musicianship. That if you, you couldn't really play rock and roll if you were too good, that if you, if you, if you got to be proficient, that you were in danger all the time of turning out t-shirts. But you can, you know, it's something we can recognise in a lot of the music that we hear nowadays, or maybe it's just good enough to do it getting old as well. Um, but uh, um, and I said the descent into cliche is not the fault of the musicians, but a trick of time. And yes, it alerts us to something really interesting, that music is a code that can simultaneously confirm what we already understand and have become bored by. But it's also a language that takes us deep into ourselves, to our hunger for the unknowable and the fantastic and the infinite and the great. It seems an extraordinary burden to place on a fragile pop song. But to my our, our ears, this song so it carries with this red white song, while also having acquired through time the capacity to alert me to the danger of confusing what I am hearing with mere attraction to a fashion expressed in sound or to a particular moment in my life. John Lennon said in a poem, and he wrote in a letter to his fellow band member Stu Sutcliffe, who was one of the original members. I can't remember anything without a sadness so deep that it hardly becomes known to me. So then, like it was really, they, like Elvis, you know, it's extraordinary tragedies to do with these people. Amy Winehouse, you know, they, they were tasked with the gift of singing not just their own griefs and their own joys, but ours also. And this is what we, this is what. This is why we wanted to see them. That's why we wanted to hear them. We didn't necessarily think about it in those terms, but that's what they were doing. I think of Amy Winehouse as like, you know, I've written about her before, like she was like this extraordinary, like fragile thing, like the filament of a bulb into which was pumped 10,000 volts of pure energy that lit it up for these moments. Same as true of Elvis, same as true of Lynn, all these people. And the question then is, you know, what you don't read in the tabloid is that when you're up there and you're doing this, you're singing the heart of every person who's listening, watching. You can't just, where do you go? They're sitting watching, you're listening. They're moved. What are you? 
you lift it out of into space and you can't come back for a long time. And just do this again and again, night after night after night, and, and the cost of it becomes so tremendous that it's, it can never be repaid. It's a debt that, that runs off the page. Paul Morley in his book, Words and Music, which I really suggest probably one of the greatest music books about rock and roll that's been written, if not the greatest. It's, it's, uh, it has a very implausible thesis. It was written about 10, 12 years ago, and its thesis is something like this, that the spirit of rock and roll at that moment resided not with Coldplay, but with Kylie Minogue. And he actually makes the thesis sustain itself in the book. But he starts the history of rock and roll with the big bang. And he goes through the various events that led up to this. It's a main journey. I'll just give you a few examples like this. We're talking about a music that, that started, you could say, in another sense, with the slaves in the plantations, chanting to one another, shouting out, their shouts becoming chants, becoming lines of songs, which became the blues. And that kind of became married to folk and country, which many of which come as strands come from Europe, from, from Ireland, from my own country. Bob Dylan, I think, you know, you could call it Bob Dylan a kind of displaced Irish troubadour. troubadour. And, and he's, he's just a, a, he could have been Irish in the sense that he stole a lot of his music from Ireland, of course. So the beginning there was this cry. And the first cry of man was 2.8 million years ago. And then there was call and response. And then the first rhythm. John Jack Rousseau said, The first rhythmic answer delivered by the hands of another. It is believed that the first musical instruments were developed for ritual and ceremonial purposes. It is not hunger or thirst, he said, but love, hatred, pity, and anger which drove, drew from men their first vocal utterances. And then the modern chord is invented and so on. Gregorian chant, 600 AD. Um, the metronome was invented in 761 by Mayfield. 1798, the term the blues first surfaced as a way of describing meaning, melancholy, and sadness in George Coleman's one act farce, Blue Devils. Tonic sulfur was invented in 1850. In 1800, Mozart composed his Mercury Mass, and at the same moment, the blues began to develop along the Mississippi Delta, and more generally throughout the deep south of the USA, emanating for, from the various traditions of working songs, spirituals, chants, shouts, and field hollers. Blues is its deepest roots in the work songs of the West African workers who were enslaved in the south of the US. To ameliorate the pain and drudgery of their back-breaking toil in the fields of the southern plantation owners, these black slaves developed a call and response mode of singing. This formed the basis of what became known as the blues. And so on. Nietzsche said, it's only through the spirit of music that we can understand the joy involved in the annihilation of the individual. Brian Ingo said that the reason traditional notation works is because classical music is so simple. This is really, it gets to be an extravagant claim because generally speaking, you know, when you, when you talk about rock and roll, you kind of are expected to accept that it's kind of an inferior, lower form of music. And, and, and that's not the case that I'm making here at all. I'm actually possibly saying a little bit more than that than I'm saying. And these guys are certainly saying this. So this is what my brain says. The reason traditional notation works is because classical music is so simple. The notes are discreet and they're not, there's not much illusion. You tend to go and then he sings like a choir boy. Ah, 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 ah. You don't go. <laughs> like, this, like they do in the, in the blues or in Arab music. That kind of thing is almost unnotable. And everything else in classical music is discontinuous. A clarinet is a clarinet. A trombone is a trombone. This isn't the case in modern music. There's everything in between as well. You can have a claribone if you want. 
You can't notate continuous fields. And here's a poem for myself, if, not, if you don't mind. The inability of classical music to evolve a language to depict the oral chaos of the world was camouflaged and validated by convenient thinking, which defined music as either uplift or escapism. Concepts which were themselves awarded different, i.e. opposite aesthetic values. Classical music was fine because it elevated you to a higher plane. Popular music was based because it distracted you from reality. The opposite of this prejudice may be as close as we can get to the truth. That classical music, because it distilled and refines, may be the real escapism. And pop, because of its infinite capacity for chaos, is capable at least of opening up a truer avenue by which to pursue both mystery and meaning. I did an interview with Bono back. I want to talk a bit about Bono later on. Because when I was doing this in the beginning, I had written a book about you too, and you too could do no wrong. Not quite like that anymore. I'll come back to that. When it started out, it was completely, this is what he said about rock and roll. When it started out, it was completely not understood, and it was obviously, you know, music made by idiots because people couldn't get this beat. What was going on in Memphis was one of the most extraordinary moments of the 20th century, where African rhythm and European melody were married. Two cultures collided in this spastic dance. A guy who wore eyeshadow and a zoot suit. It was an extraordinary thing, but it completely missed the intelligentsia. The people were going to the opera or were listening to what was regarded as the modern music of the time. And here it was happening in Dogtown, in the back of a shop. John Lennon said this beautiful quote from, from 1970. The blues is real. It's not perverted or thought about. It's not a concept. It's a chair. Not a design for a chair, or a better chair, or a bigger chair, or a chair with leather on. It is the first chair. It is a chair for sitting on, not for looking at or being appreciated. You sit on this music. And Bono said, Orchestras can't play rhythm. The most brilliant musicians in the world and the finest orchestras, you can't get them to play rhythm. They don't understand it. It's like a muscle they haven't developed. And rock and roll music is where Africa and Europe collide. There in that moment. And they don't understand that half, that half of the equation. So it's a bit like you, if you judge meaning based on verbs, but not adjectives. Because that's all you spoke. They're not actually listening. Rhythm is not articulate to them. Jimi Hendrix said, A musician, if he's a messenger, is like a child who hasn't been handled too many times by man, hasn't had too many finger fingerprints across his brain. That's why music is so much heavier than anything you ever felt. The era, uh, this moment of the song, See, this is, I think, where, where rock and roll is so different to every other form of music because it has all these qualities, but it also has a quality that the, the performance may be everything. A song written by one songwriter for one singer cannot maybe ever match anybody else and it can be the most extraordinary thing and everything else is a failure afterwards. Or the opposite sometimes happens where somebody writes a song and it's nothing and then somebody sings it and it's new. Um, there's a song by Bruce Springsteen that's like that, I think, uh, Highway uh, Patrolman, which he sings, it's okay, but then Johnny Cash sings it and it's just like epic. It's, it's just, and he just sings it as Johnny Cash, he doesn't do anything other than be Johnny Cash, but somehow it's like one of the greatest stories ever told in his voice. There's an Irish poet, I mentioned him, Patrick Kavanagh, um, and he, he, this idea of the words, you know, that words are like, Father Gisani had a wonderful phrase about words, he says, we use the least inadequate words, like, it's kind of an admission that all words are failure, all, everything, all, all writing is failure, and it is, anything I have for you, right, you don't succeed in saying what you want to say. All you succeed is, is in uttering a truth that somebody else will recognise and, and not require all the words that you've, even the words you've used to say it, because they know it already. I'm, 
Pablo Cavani used to say that poetry wasn't literature, that it was theology. And the quality of a poem that made it a poem was what he called the flash, uh, which was the other, which essentially God appearing into the poem, into the world. And that was, he said, the function of the poet to make God visible in the world. And the flash was, I, I remember his brother Peter, who was a lot younger than him, but who took care of Patrick all his life, long after his death, up to the age of 90. Uh, he was his sacred keeper, he called him, uh, Patrick called him. And uh, I interviewed him one night in, uh, in Trinity College in a bit, something like this. And I said to him, what is the relationship between the, the words and the flash? And he said, ah, oh, the words are the least important part. He said, in a poem, the words burn up in a tremendous threat of something unusual. And I think this, this is something about there's something about the mystery of what words do in a song, like in a rock and roll song. Because you can hear the same song a million times, you can love the song. I think you have a vague idea what it's about, but when you see the words written down, it's something completely different. It happens to me all the time. But it doesn't actually matter, because something about the words is actually part of the sound of the song, part of the personality of the song and it's saying something deeper than the words are capable of saying. And you know what that is. You're attracted to that, whatever that is. And you know, some of the great singers, like Van Morrison, probably the great white blue singer. I know he's Irish, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, he had that capacity to you know, he would, he would, when he would write a song, he said, I only write words once. I only deal with words once when I write the song. After that, because you actually listen to him, it's like he's constantly attacking the words and trying to destroy them and trying to break them up into fragments or, you know, and, and, and deliver them in some way that will actually allow them to transcend themselves and escape from their, mean, their literal meanings and become something that is related to the music in a way that he cannot possibly explain and you cannot possibly understand and yet you get it when you hear into it. This is something about rock and roll that is actually unspeakable. Paul Morley, who I mentioned in this book, he talks about words of music. He talks about the abstract series of sound shapes and noise forms that can communicate something specific to us without the use of words. And that's what rock and roll is. It begins in words, but some of the words are absorbed into something else. Some ambition that's greater than the words are capable of becoming beyond description and telling. And those poetic devices like onomatopoeia and alliteration we learn about in school. Morley says that the words in a song, they disappear into themselves as though boiled down, as if they were changing from solid to liquid to form a sensuous, absorbing musical form that implies how all music began with the human voice. The sound of the human voice imitating sounds around us, the sounds of nature, animals, even the sound of silence, the sound of the human voice copying the voice of God. Now, Paul Morley is an atheist, and uh, there's no culture on the word God there. So he means both what we may understand as God and also what he understands as God, or maybe something halfway between the two. I shared a platform once and I actually inadvertently used the word God when I was speaking and I think he got a bit freaked out. <laughs> and, and then I asked for a selfie with him later and that really blew it, you know. <laughs> but, but he is a really extraordinary writer because he's one of these great writers who you, you, you feel safe from the very first sentence in his character. You know that he's not going to, to, to lead you astray and that he's going to lead you to somewhere really special. And that's kind of, I think, the challenge of any book, you know, it has to do that. I read a book on the play, I won't say what it was called, it was about David Bowie, and, and I, uh, it was billed as one of the greatest rock and roll books ever, but I couldn't get beyond the first 30 pages because it didn't do that. It just regurgitated really tabloid cliches. Um, but Morley is exceptional, if you can get that book, it's great. And he wrote another great book as well called Nothing, about the death, the suicide of his father. Really, it's, it's exceptional. And John Lennon said, 
Why do I have to explain what sound is? I mean, we all sit by the sea and listen to it. But do we say, this sea is good because it's reminiscent of childhood experience when we were at the seaside, or it's like your mother's water, or anything like that? People just lie in fields and listen to birds, and nobody says a thing. Language and song, he said, is for me, apart from being pure vibrations, just like trying to describe a dream. And because we don't have telepathy or whatever it is, we try and describe the dream to each other, to verify to each other what we know, what we believe is inside each other. But no matter how you say it, it's never how you want to say it, because the words are irrelevant. That's kind of what I was saying. So Yara is a kind of a fusion of several words that are not quite words at all. It contains something of the exclamation, it's an Irish thing, ah! It's a kind of, uh, you know, if you met somebody in the street, ah! Or sometimes it's something in, in it's this expression of grief, or sometimes of joy. It's a kind of an affirmation, a yes. Glenn Mar Marcus says about Van Morrison, his music can be heard as an attempt to surrender to the Yara, or to make it surrender to him, to find the music it wants, to bury it, to dig it out of the ground. The Yara is his version of the art that has touched him, of blues and jazz, for that matter of Yeats and Ned Belly, the voice that strikes a note so exalted you can't believe a human being is responsible for it, a note so unfinished and unsatisfied you can understand why the Eternal seems to be riding on its back. He said, Mar Morrison will hold, take hold of the Yara, or get close to it, raise his spectre even as he falls back before it, for the moment defeated with horns, volume, quiet, melody and rhythm, and the abandonment of both, in the twist of phrase or the dissolution of words into syllables and syllables into preferable grunts and moans, he will pursue it perhaps most of all in repetition, railing or sailing the same word 10, 20, 30 times until it has taken his song where he wants it to go or failed to crack the wall around it. And John Lennon, in his beautiful song for his mother, Julia, he says, my title, When I Cannot Sing My Heart, I Can Only Speak My Mind, Julia. Then it said, you know, Einstein or Newton, anything that was discovered was discovered by accident, by creative spirit. Or they were tuned into whatever came down at that moment, right? What did Einstein do? He spilled the theory of relativity when he was working on something else. He spent the rest of his life trying to prove something else, which you can never do. So what he did was really live off that record for the rest of his life. <laughs> Not taken away from his brilliance or his natural ability, but the real creation came when he sat there and something came to him, or when the apple fell on his head. Newton would never have had the apple fall on his head and conceive of what it meant had he not been sitting under the tree, daydreaming. So for me, it's the same with music. The real music comes to me, the music of the spheres, the music that surpasses understanding, that has not to do with me, of which I'm just a channel. So for that to come true, which is the only joy for me out of the music, is for it to be given to me. And I, I transcribe it like a medium. But I have nothing to do with it other than I'm sitting under the tree, and the whole damn thing comes down and I just put it down. Bono said, the way we write sometimes we feel that the song is written, the song is already there. If it would just put it into words, put it into notes, we have it, but it's not realized yet, it's not formed. We very rarely lose a song to some kind of limit. If, if you saw, <coughs> If you saw us in the studio working sometimes, you'd be scratching your head trying to figure out what we were doing. Mostly, mostly if I get the idea that we're onto something, but we eventually get there. I have to skip through this because I've only got some time running out. Um, Bob Dylan. Um, 
Dillon wrote it was well, supposedly was to do with uh, the 60s. And, um, the times are changing. And, and it was clear that he never really accepted this idea that he was a spokesman for a generation. <coughs> this is a quote from when he talked about this. And it's kind of accepted that the, this music, as I said, that the, the, the way we talk about it is, and the way the critics talk about it, we reduce it away from the ambitions of the artists. Because the artists couldn't do the great, the, what, what they do, the incredible things they do had their ambitions not been great, greater than just producing songs to be played on the radio or to make a set for a live gig. Bob Dylan said, I had a wife and children whom I love more than anything else in the world. I was trying to provide for them, keep out of trouble, but the big books and the press kept promoting me as the mouthpiece spokesman or even conscience of a generation. That was fine. All I'd ever done was sing songs that were dead straight and express powerful new realities. I had very little in common with and knew even less about a generation that I was supposed to be the voice of. I'd left my hometown only ten years earlier, wasn't vociferating the opinions of anybody. My destiny lay down the road was whatever life invited, had nothing to do with representing any kind of civilization. Being true to myself, that was the thing. I was more a cowpuncher than a pipe piper. He said again, we're all sinners, is Dylan. People seem to think that because their sins are different from other people's sins, they're not sinners. It makes them feel uncomfortable. What do you mean sinners? It puts them at a disadvantage in their mind. Most people walking around have this strange conception that they're born good, that they're really good people, that the world has just made a mess out of their lives. I have another point of view, but it's not hard for me to identify with someone who's on the wrong side. We're all on the wrong side, really. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you one thing, he says. There's no way I could write something that would be scripturally incorrect. I mean, I'm not going to put forth any ideas that aren't scripturally true. I might reverse them or make them come up a different way. I'm not going to say anything that's just totally wrong, that there's no law for. Because the Bible runs through all US life, whether people know it or not. It's the founding book, the founding father's book, anyway. People can't get away from it. You can't get away from it, whatever, wherever you go. Those ideas were true then and they're true now. They're scripture, scripture laws. I guess people can read into that what they want. But if they're familiar with these concepts, they'll probably find enough of them in my stuff. Because I always get back to that. Mm -hmm. I'm running out of time and I want to play another video. But I want to say this, so I want to wrap up. Uh, what was the central theme of the idea of this exhibition I did was that we live in a world that, that it's impossible to communicate really deep and complicated things that we all feel to each other in our culture. Maybe they happen in books and we can read them in, in private. Uh, they're, they're not on TV, they're not on the radio, they're certainly not on Twitter. You can't... So more and more we're isolated in this kind of moronic cacophony where we just regurgitate it. The, the, the slogans and mantras of simplistic minds. And rock and roll exists, in my opinion, to be the antidote to that, and always has. But because of the nature of that culture that, that encloses it, it needs to conceal its true purpose. So that's why you, know, you have all of this confusion about what rock and roll really is, that it's entertainment. And there's so many eruptions of things, like narcissism and hedonism, nihilism and all of this, that, that distract and give fodder to the tabloids. Amy Winehouse, for what? She died of what? She died of uh, uh, alcohol poisoning, something like that. No, she died of misunderstanding her genius, of underestimating what she had, of not having anybody to tell her what actually was happening to her being and her body in her time. That's the tragedy. It's the tragedy of Elvis. It's the tragedy of all of these people. So what happens is that all of, the, all of us in our opinion, you know, there's a process by which the artist writes a song in a hotel room or wherever. And that song has a, something that is profound but deniable. 
which is communicated to all masses of wires and signals to the listener in his or her bedroom and a pair of headphones. And that communication is complete. And when you see, that's where you get the uh, uh, ecstatic response to rock and roll that you see in the live concert because suddenly then all those people come out of their bedrooms and stand in front of that Your person God. who is the, uh, who represents this process almost like a ritual. So, our culture doesn't allow us to talk about these things and very rarely does, does anybody break the silence about it as to the real meaning of what is actually a thought. Because it's actually, the code is such that it's actually unbreakable. But from time to time, and this is what I want to finish with, um, somebody does something that alerts us to the true significance of what is happening. And it's ironic that the person who did this possibly was the, the, the artist who more and more, in, as the 70s went into the 80s and beyond, became more and more identified with this kind of the tabloid cliche of the degenerate lifestyle of rock and rollers and uh, the hedonistic, nihilistic. But then he, 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 he went on another, another journey and he stopped drinking and he stopped drugging and he became, started going to Alcoholics Anonymous and places like that. Then, But I think it was 91, this concert was um, then the first anniversary of um, the death of Freddie Mercury, the singer with uh, Queen. And this is a video which uh, is on YouTube and you, know, you can find it, but nobody ever mentions it. That there are books about this guy, David Bowie, that never mention it. It's probably one of the most sensational moments, uh, in my opinion, in rock and roll. Uh, and nobody ever talks about it. It's not in any book about Bowie. It's not in articles about Bowie. Uh, but it does something that I think is... It makes literal the things I'm talking about. Because sometimes, as I say, the words of the songs are inadequate. And the, the songs themselves are, are secret. And Bowie does something in this moment that is is to acknowledge all of this and to take us into the truth of where we are, what is happening, and why it is happening. So, David Bowie. Thank you. It's not a great friend for anybody. I'd also like us to remember our friends, your friends, my friends, who have died. Basically, the distant past. Friends are still living in some of them. Your face is possibly because of your family that have been troubled by this relentless disease. I'll be taken by to extend my wishes to Frank Craig and the watching me. And I'd like to offer something in a very simple fashion that is the most direct way that I can think of you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of the trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, 